Hi, everyone. Welcome to our next seminar. This is the Data Science Coast to Coast seminar. It's a series that is hosted jointly by seven academic data science institutes. Five seminars will be in the spring and will feature faculty and new postdocs. These seminars will be launching for follow-up research discussions and meetings that will hopefully lead to fruitful collaboration. Uh, here's a little bit about the series. Uh, our next one will be in a couple of weeks and we'll be talking about biodiversity and then the next uh, one will be ocean dynamics. I am super excited today to actually get to meet Dr. Jagadish, also known as Jag, and uh, uh, Jean talks about you all the time, so it's really great to meet you. He, uh, Jag is the director of the Michigan Institute for uh, Data Science and also a professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Michigan. His talk today will be on data equity, a core requirement for responsible data science. And then we'll talk with Sierra Martinez, who is uh, part of the Biodiversity and Environmental Sciences uh, Lead, or oh, that's her title, Berkeley at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. And she will be talking about open science as, as a community of practice. Um, I thank you guys for being here today and I'm looking forward to this. Thank you, Angela. Um, let me share screen and get started. So thank you all for uh, having me here. Uh, I wanted to talk about data equity. Um, so if one wants to take a step back and see what humans do with computers, uh, we invented computers to assist us uh, with things that we'd like to do. Uh, they can remember a lot more than our little brains can remember. Uh, you know, et cetera. And so, and so the idea is we interact with computers to get stuff done. And the way one thinks about this is, or assumes without actually even saying this, is that humans have agencies, agency and they instruct computers what to do. Uh, computers just follow the instructions that are programmed into them by a human. And so if you talk, talk about human computer interaction, People talk about human in the loop. The general idea is that humans are analyzing things, exploring things, uh, and, and the computers providing results, suggestions, help for the humans. Now, if you take this idea and put it into the big data context, almost everything that we as humans say or do gets sucked into our digital exhaust. And these data are then fed into algorithms that make decisions that affect us. And some of these decisions are perhaps not of that much consequence in terms of the kind of advertising we see or you know, uh, sales that are offered to us. But others can be far more consequential, like pre-employment screening or uh, sentencing for criminals or qualification for loans, right? So these are substantial life affecting decisions that can be made uh, based upon things that we have said and done. So if one looks at the human in the loop now for data science, what we have is that humans are creating digital exhaust, big data processes are working on these and these then create an impact on humans. And really all that has changed here is the question of who has agency in this loop. Um, the, the point that I wanna make is the reason that that loop exists is because there are some humans and some companies that want to program computers to do the second kind of loop. And so, uh, if, if you're rich or smart, you can baffle your digital exhaust, you can build high walls and hide behind it. Uh, if you're powerful, it's unlikely that you'll become a target for denial of a loan or, or parole or uh, have a life affecting decision made in a bad way. So uh, the impact of this kind of new technology loop are felt more by the less able, less powerful, more marginalized uh, sections of society. 
And this is the notion of data inequity. So the question that I want to talk about today is what we can do about it and how we can promote data equity or reduce inequity. So to begin with, I guess we need to say a little more clearly what data equity is. There's been a lot of talk about fairness. And so I wanna start out by saying equity is a related concept, but it is not the same thing. So let me first take a short detour and talk about fairness. So historically, people have thought about being data-driven as sort of the objective standard. And so you would have people say things like the data speak for themselves and algorithms are just operating on the data and they're unbiased. That's what, you know, it, it's just a procedural thing that comes out. Um, today, it's uh, more recognized that automated decisions can be systematically unfair. Um, and there's a whole stream of research on fairness in AI and in data science. There are a number of challenges in terms of this kind of research area. For one thing, there are many possible definitions of fairness. Uh, often there isn't even a social consensus on what it means for things to be fair. Um, and answers can be situation dependent. Um, there's, you know, to begin with, there are things like, are we treating individuals without prejudice? Um, are we obtaining equitable group outcomes? These are two very reasonable things stated in English, but um, they're not the same thing. Um, and in fact, there are theorems to show that for uh, any small number of definitions, like two definitions out of dozens that one can come up with, you cannot guarantee uh, uh, that, you, that, that, that there is no way to meet all of them. So anyway, there's a, there's a rich body of work along these lines. And I think that this is a great start uh, in terms of thinking about fairness. I also want to take a small segue here and point out that humans have many biases. Even if we have the best of intentions, it's very hard for us to be perfectly fair. And what's worse is that humans are good at explaining things away. And so I might have actually made a biased decision about something because of some subliminal trigger about something about the way you look, um, but I'll never admit it. And it may not even be in my consciousness. So it's not even, uh, uh, an intentional thing, um, I will have other plausible explanations that I might construct for why I thought you were not trustworthy or you weren't going to do well at the job or, or whatever it was that, that I had this uh, subliminal emotional negative reaction to. Um, with algorithms, you can measure bias. And so uh, you can aspire to do a lot better. Um, and so there's value to trying to make these algorithms do the right thing and help them uh, think about how one, one does it. So when one thinks about how we're gonna solve this and one thinks about the work that has been done on fairness, this sort of fits into the popular con conception of big data being fed into this big AI magic box that generates deep insights. And these deep insights then go help us uh, accomplish whatever it is that uh, we need to do, like doing classification. And it isn't just the popular press. Companies like to uh, tell the same story. This is 
a picture that I got from the website of a Silicon Valley company. So uh, what we found though, is that there is a big data ecosystem and there are many, many parts to this ecosystem. And um, a whole bunch of us uh, from um, a range of institutions around the country wrote a white paper about this a few years ago, uh, pointing out that uh, the work that needs to be done with respect to big data is um, much broader than um, any one box that somebody might get focused on. And what I wanna say is that in this big picture of the big data pipeline, if you think about where AI fits, that's the analysis and modeling piece. So you're, you're building AI models. And that's very important. And that might be even perhaps the most interesting box, but it is only one of the boxes. And if one is going to address questions of equity, one has to be thinking about it um, at all of these stages of this pipeline um, and, and at everywhere in the ecosystem. Um, so let me then move on to what equity is. And uh, this cartoon depicts the idea very well. Um, the picture on the left might be somebody's mathematical definition of fairness and perhaps actually a very reasonable definition of how you might fairly distribute uh, boxes to stand on. Um, and what we want to do is to think about uh, a, a more holistic solution uh, like the one on the right. And when one thinks about what that means, um, what we find is that there are many sources of inequity in the world. Just like in the cartoon, there were three people of different heights. And technology uh, is an amplifier. It's an amplifier of good things and bad things. Uh, and if we just use technology to speed up things, uh, we might speed up things that are inequitable and we might actually end up exacerbating inequities because of this amplification. And so what we want are to, is to build systems that amplify the desirable parts of data science and mute inequities. Right? So this is what we call data equity systems. And if one thinks about different aspects of the data science uh, ecosystem, one can think about different ways in which uh, different places that one has to uh, address questions of equity. So let's begin with data acquisition. What sources are available. Who's represented in these sources? What is measured? Is that what we really want to measure? Almost always we have proxies for the things that we really care about. And we have to worry about how the proxy differs from what we would want. And then there are questions of who's in the data and what we owe to them. Uh, do we have privacy responsibilities? Uh, do we have a promise of no repurposing of the data that we might have acquired for one reason or another? Then we get to data cleaning and integration. Um, real data are always messy and data cleaning is necessary. But if you're gonna do data cleaning, cleaning is based on some assumptions. There's some model of what's dirty in the data. So for example, if you have missing values in the data, rarely are these values missing at random. And so if one assumes that missing values are randomly missing, uh, one is likely to end up with a systematic bias in the data set that one then uses for analysis. Um, for that matter, if one even throws away records with missing values for some attributes, that will also create uh, 
bias in the data, again, because the missing is not at random. Then representation choices matter. Uh, there's a lot of representation choice that gets made. You might, for instance, do sentiment analysis on text. You might bucketize values. For example, you might put age or salary or things like this into categories and, and define some boundaries. You might define geographic boundaries for some spatial analysis. And, and any of these kinds of things uh, are it result in a represented data set where the results that you're going to get will be affected by the choices that you made upstream. And these choices are often uh, not even considered in any uh, serious way. You just take this for granted. Um, it also is something that uh, that's true. It's kind of an obvious thing, but people don't think about it, is what questions you can ask depends on what you have chosen to represent. And uh, we'll, we'll see that there's, that there's a, a lot of, uh, decisions that a data scientist makes that uh, impact what analysis is uh, facilitated or, or enabled. Once analysis has been done, there is result presentation. There's a question of explaining what data were used. Uh, there's a question of uh, being able to convince a user that the results are trustworthy. Um, there are limits on what can be disclosed. There might be proprietary things in the methods used. There might be privacy constraints on the data values. And we still have to be able to tell enough to potential users that they can uh, trust the results. There's also a thing that's somewhat counterintuitive uh, with using cutting edge technology in that cutting edge technology can actually ossify old structures and retain them. And that's because a basic truism of machine learning is that training data are from the past, but the application of the model is in the future. And so the assumption is that the future is going to be like the past. If the time constants are small, this is usually true. However, um, if the time constants are large, uh, if societies change over these period, for example, then uh, we have a significant issue here because uh, we are, the machine learned models are based on things from the past and really should not be used. So as an intermediate point, in terms of the big picture, uh, we have a notion of data equity. Um, we need to consider this in all parts of the data ecosystem. And uh, we need to address these problems by building data equity systems. So what do we do with this? I wanna talk about equity from a different perspective um, and, and start talking about some solutions. So we've identified four facets of data equity, uh, which each of which I'll talk about uh, in the next minutes. So first, a representation equity. Uh, there are underrepresented groups that are historically suppressed in the data record. And we have to deal with this upfront when we begin with any data set that we're gonna do uh, use in our data science pipeline. So um, if one considers COVID-19 as my running example, um, there might be racial disparities in the availability of testing. This was certainly true early in the pandemic. And there might also be disparities in the desire of individuals to be tested in terms of whether they trust the medical system. And for both of these reasons, uh, there's likely to be systematic biases in the collected data in terms of uh, how many uh, COVID-19 cases were reported, confirmed uh, by race. 
And if you're going to get that kind of systematic bias in the data, and then you're going to do some kind of analysis on the, the impact of COVID on health and, and look at disparities by race, um, you've, you've really got to uh, adjust appropriately if you're going to get uh, valid results. So we've been doing work on what we call coverage, looking not just at one attribute, uh, but at uh, intersectional representation um, on various attributes of interest, like, like sex and age and race and so on. And uh, finding uh, combinations of attributes that are underrepresented in a data set and, and uh, trying to develop methods to correct for these uh, representation inequities. Um, we also um, have work on pattern counts, which I'm gonna skip uh, in the interest of time. I wanna move on and talk about feature equity. Um, if one thinks about representation equity as issues of rows in a table, feature equity has to do with the columns of the table. So it is what attributes are we recording in the data set? Um, if certain attributes are not recorded, then some kinds of information is just not present in the database. And uh, therefore it's not available for analysis. So for example, if race is not recorded uh, when somebody's treated um, or somebody's tested for COVID-19, then, um, and then you want to ask questions about any systematic biases or racial disparities in, in health, um, you have to somehow impute race because it was not actually recorded in the data. So uh, that becomes a challenge. One of the things that one has to address with feature uh, equity is whether one is recording features that might be material to particular subgroups in the data set. Um, features that may not matter to others uh, or, or, the, or the majority of the entries. Um, and it is certainly the case that the richness of real life is lost when represented in a few bits. And, and there's a lot of uh, scholarship on, you know, thick data or how one represents more or captures more of the nuance of real life. However, capturing data in uh, a few bits permits quantitative analysis. And so that's why this is done. The key point is that this quantization matters. We have to think about how this is done. Also, recall issues of human bias. Given that humans are biased, qualitative inference is not necessarily better. It allows room for human prejudice. So for example, there's a lot of talk about vaccination passports these days. If there are to be vaccination passports, we want these to be uniform. You want these to be issued by a centralized authority. Um, you want for anybody who is examining a passport not to have to exercise their judgment uh, because the more you leave that up to human judgment, the more disparities there will be in terms of uh, acceptance of the vaccination passport and whatever benefits are supposed to be provided with it. Um, in terms of our research, we've done a bunch of work on fairness in ranking. And uh, the basic idea is that you can uh, change the weights that you give to 
various criteria that you might wish to apply. Um, uh, and and uh, that can significantly impact uh, who gets uh, ranked higher or who gets selected. Um, I'm not gonna go into more detail since I have just a couple of minutes and I wanna talk about a couple of other types of equity. So access equity is uh, who has access to the data and data products that are created. Um, and here it's, it's you know, sharing of results, uh, not hoarding. Um, and there's a lot of work on data sharing and reuse, but also a question of how results are presented, whether the way that results are presented uh, enables people to, to understand the data and come up with, with uh, good, uh, will come up with a fair understanding as well as being able to trust the data. So for example, one could honestly on this kind of a squiggly time chart, pick the two uh, dotted points and claim that there is a decreasing trend. Uh, the claim of a decreasing trend is obviously laughable on this data set, even though the fact that it went, that, that whatever we're measuring here went down from October to June is, uh, completely true. So we've been doing a bunch of work on different types of cherry picking. Um, it turns out that uh, there is a notion of stability, uh, which is how one has defined a model uh, and whether the model gives results that wouldn't change if you perturb model parameters. And so if you look at uh, department rankings uh, at, at one of the popular websites that does this, um, we showed that uh, there, are, there are many choices of department rankings that one could come up with by changing model parameters. And uh, again, I'm gonna just move on. Uh, I'm happy to address questions about any of, the, any of these things or the technical things uh, at, later on. Finally, we want to talk about outcome equity, which is um, mitigating unintended consequences. Um, it, even, if, even if we have tried to think about all the different aspects of equity as we've designed our systems, we may have issues. So for instance, contract tracing apps may result in stigma or harassment. And you know, there has been kind of, there've been uh, reports in some countries of retribution on people who um, tested positive for COVID. Um, so we need to address all of these things and we have um, a significant project uh, on what we call a framework for integrative data equity systems that's uh, uh, supported by NSF. And uh, uh, this is collaborative with um, uh, my uh, colleagues and friends, Bill and Julia, who are at um, two of the other universities that are participating in uh, this series. So I'm gonna uh, stop here and um, take uh, questions and then hand it off to Sierra. Actually, I think we'll handle, uh, let's do the questions at the end uh, with, uh, with both you and Sierra, if that's okay. So I'll, I'll get Sierra to pop up real quick. And that way, because I'm assuming you guys' topics together will blend real well. And lead to live, lively discussion. Okay, let me just get this in order here. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me today and giving me an opportunity to talk about my work. Um, I pivoted to talk about a specific uh, project I was working on because it was just published last month. So I'm gonna focus on that paper. Um, and that paper really aims to help researchers who are performing open science and data analysis in the wild. So how, specifically how to design data intensive research products. So I want to start 
a little bit with my background because I think it really informs how I approach open science, computational reproducibility, and overall um, how we communicate about these topics um, within academia specifically. And I also think that my path to these topics is a, a very popular one, and it highlights the challenges that uh, we all face when trying to do data science and data intensive research or, um, properly, um, in quotes. So uh, I got my PhD, not really interested in programming or data science at all. I was really fascinated with evolution, specifically plants and how they get their shape. Um, and I did this mostly through molecular work, so wet lab work, pipetting small amounts of liquids into different tubes and spending hundreds of hours in um, dark rooms with fancy microscopes. Um, and then I found myself drowning in data and I didn't know how to program. And as a PhD student, I was already drowning in my do domain expertise, being a new PhD student. And I was overwhelmed and overworked and, there really wasn't a clear path at that time to understand how to get out of it. I knew I wanted to use this data to answer the questions I was truly interested in, but I don't know how to get there. So I knew I had to program, but that's just a small fraction of what I needed to learn to do this work properly um, and in a reproducible manner. So you have to learn how to make your code open and you have to learn how to make it readable. You have to, learn Git, which was terrifying <laughs> at the time. Um, and all of it's really hard. And you're, you're balancing this with already your domain expertise. So it seemed like everyone I talked to at that time who knew what they were doing, I was confronted with um, some very opinionated strategies and often contradicting strategies. And they were using terminology uh, that was confusing depending on which domain expert I was talking to. And it was just really difficult. And it still is very difficult for someone new coming into this. So it took me many years to find a community that were more empathetic to beginner users. Um, but over time I learned how to program and, and I really thrived. And I fell in love with data and programming and data science in general. And the main thing I love about it is that it changed how I approach my research and how I approach my science. It allowed me to ask bigger questions and it made me see the world in a new way, kind of with these data streams all around me. Um, and these big questions is really what I kind of gravitated towards. And that's basically what I do now as the research lead uh, of biodiversity and environmental sciences at BIDS. I focus on large data intensive work that tackle um, big questions like how life on this planet reacts to a, a very uh, climate um, uncertain future. Um, and I like focusing on big teams and using large data repositories for that. But backing up a little bit, um, Early on when I was learning, I became really passionate about giving back and giving to the community and how we train our next generation of programmers and data scientists and really focus on how to properly teach them these skills. Um, and I found that actually teaching data analysis in a reproducible way is actually very difficult. And I became obsessed with the question of why it is so difficult. And so it's been over 10 years now that I've begun training for data science methodologies, especially in reproducible science. And I consider myself now more, well, just as much a data science as I am a biologist. And while I was doing my um, postdoc, I found a community of people who are also obsessed with this question of why, why is it so hard to teach data science and what data science really looks like when performing research. And uh, through many conversations with both software engineers, computer scientists, statisticians, the whole gamut the, of multidisciplinary researchers at, at BIDS, um, we began having conversations about defining reproducible data workflows and building a way to teach others um, and, and especially best practices of data science. And I truly found kindred spirits in Sarah Stout and Valerie Baskins. Um, 
And what resulted from meeting with them regularly is a collaboration of this new paper that was just published last month in PLOS Computational Biology. So our paper is entitled aptly uh, Principles for Computational Biology or Principles for Data Analysis Workflows. Um, and that's what I'm gonna focus on for my talk. And again, this is gonna be kind of a higher level overview of the paper. So if you're interested in that, please find the table, uh, the paper, just Google, it's, it's open and, um, or go to this tinyurl.com backslash data workflows. And especially if you know new students, so this, the audience for this paper is students new to research or researchers who are new to data intensive work. Um, I basically wrote this paper for past me who was drowning in data and didn't have a clear path on how to design my way through a research, a data intensive research project. So it all started that we knew that all of these subjects, they were connected, um, but we didn't know the context and the exact definition of how they were connected. And when we were having conversations about these, there's lots of overlap on how they're connected. And it was always muddled in our minds. Um, for example, uh, like how is software development skills important with data analysis? Like we knew they were important, but are all the, is off, all of software development or software engineering skills important, like, like tests? Like, what does it mean to do test-driven data analysis? What does it mean to do a unit test in data analysis? Um, and we knew that the, there's a lot of important things in software development that can be transferred, but we wanted to really define this and so people could actually talk about that. Or for instance, uh, we know open science and reproducibility, they're like intricately linked, but are the motivations the same? And how do we relate these two when navigating through our large project? How do we do that when we're navigating a career in academia? And so on and so forth. Um, so our like big overarching goal is to kind of make as many connections as possible and tease apart these connections and provide context, motivation, and terminology used when communicating about each of these subjects. So, and we wanted to give guidance, not just define it, but actually give guidance on how to design a research project workflow. So we got together like weekly to discuss this, um, me, Valerie and Sarah. And I'm the first to admit that early conversations were just crazy. We felt like we were solving some, some crazy crime, um, trying to make all these connections and lay it out more systematically. Um, and we're really, uh, we're really inspired by, de by design thinking in which you approach a project and you really define the challenges or what are the problems. And so we went back to this question of why, why teaching data analysis so hard and narrowed it down to three main aspects. And that's working openly and with reproducibility in mind. This takes time, we all know this. And then there's little incentive within academia to, to do this properly. Two, every research project is unique. So not only are the skills and tools unique for each domain, each data set, but the people you work with also have a particular school uh, skill set and tool set that they want to use or languages. The community standards for each domain are drastically different. If you're coming from social science or neuroscience, um, they're drastically different, especially between journals. And then the last bit is that projects evolve over time. So even if you set a project up perfectly in the beginning, that project is gonna evolve. The people involved are gonna also evolve. Um, and you'll be kind of battling with, there's no right way. Um, and then data analysis often gets conflated with software development workflows. And I've kind of mentioned this earlier. Um, these are different workflows, but we use very similar terminology, but sometimes this terminology is synonymous, sometimes it's analogous, um, and we wanted to tease that apart. So that was the first thing. So the goals of the paper is we wanted to describe how data analysis is really performed 
in the wild so, and making people at the center of the decision making. We wanted to provide principles for how to design your own bespoke workflow and to tease apart the difference between software development analysis and highlight though, the useful principles from software engineering that you could bring into your data analysis workflows. We wanted to be tool and language agnostic because that's drastically changing all the time. And we wanted to define and put this uh, terminology into context. So right in the beginning of the paper, we have this big terminology box with lots of references. So someone new to data intensive research or can um, easily follow what is going on, which is often glossed over when you read about this. Um, and I highly recommend going and seeing this box. I'm, I'm proud about box one just in general. Um, that being said, I've said workflow like 20 times already and I haven't defined it for you. And workflow and pipeline is these two terms that are often used synonymously and very differently depending on the context. So right now I'm gonna just define how I am using it in the paper and in this talk. So a workflow um, is a series of processes involving humans navigating through performing data analysis. And each step of the process can involve a lot of things, code documentation. And particularly it's this human intervention, intervention part that um, makes it a workflow. And it's not necessarily linear in nature. And a pipeline is a series of processes, not I would put in data analysis, but not necessarily only in data analysis, but it involves data cleaning, this is more linear in nature usually, and it can be programmatically defined. And the key here is that this can be automated by a computer. So steps can usually be described in relation to inputs and outputs. And a public service announcement that <laughs> developing a, a fully automated pipeline is really hard. Um, so this is not the norm, just in case you've been trying to do this. So I, I just keep laughing at this tweet from last week of uh, a bioinformatic pipeline. So in my head, this would be a workflow because you might be gluing a bunch of scripts together and tools, but there's always kind of a human there like pushing it along. Um, and that's what a lot of um, data analysis pipelines look like in the beginning of a project. So, we developed what we're calling the ERP data analysis workflow. And we named it after what we define as three main uh, phases of a data analysis project. So this is the main figure of the project. I'm gonna tease this part a little bit in the next few slides. So a data analysis workflow is described by a series of decisions represented by branches on the schematic of a, of a tree. So the standards of reproducibility, code organization, code structure, documentation, et cetera. This is really a spectrum and it becomes more stringent as the project evolves. And so the uh, key to the, the ERP workflow is that these design, design decisions that you make when designing your workflow um, and the movement through the phases is largely determined by two main things and that is the audience and the research products that you are creating. Sorry, the um, video is blocking a lot of my slides. I can't seem to fix it, but we'll go on. Um, so I'm gonna just briefly go over each stage and again, um, for more details, see the paper. We actually go into questions you can ask yourself during these phases and when you're designing your workflow. Um, but I'm gonna just do a higher level of each of these phases. So in the exploratory phase, which is the first phase, this is the messy part of the phase where you're testing your data, you're looking at missing data pieces, you're looking at the distributions of your data, you're looking at what tools work and don't work with your data. And, and this is a really creative process. Uh, you're trying a lot of things and the project could go in many different ways. Um, this is also where you hit a lot of dead ends. And the main audience here is yourself or your future self. So you do wanna document your code. I'm not saying this 
the spectrum of being reproducible at this stage or being organized is less, but you do want to document for yourself and future self, just as it need to be as stringent as later on. Um, because a lot of the stuff here you're going to leave behind. And I'm not saying that these pieces aren't important. The process of the exploratory self phase in itself is important to go through, but you don't need to spend a lot of time perfecting the data management and data documentation um, early on in the project. And in the refinement phase, and I want to also mention right now, you can go back and forth through these phases, but just to identify where you are in the phase is the key here. So in the refinement phase, um, your audience is your small team. And in academia, this is usually your lab or your collaborators or a group of interns. It's who you share your data with. It's who you talk about the results of your data with. And you keep them at the forefront of your mind when you are developing data management schemes and developing documentation. The standards here are defined by your team. And this is when maybe documenting your data management strategies for the team becomes more important. The key here is that the purpose of this phase is so that you can work with your team. You guys are using similar strategies so that you can review each other's code, um, use each other's tools, borrow each other's scripts and things like that that become very important for a cohesive working data science team. And so the polishing phase is to polish your research project products for your wider research community. So this is what it's gonna help your community. And this is kind of a backwards L shape. Um, and the standards of this phase are more stringent, but again, they're very specific about the research community you're in. So this is also important why you need to, as a community, keep in your mind what you need from people doing research in the field. Um, and how that's different from the, the standards that you have for a small research team in your field. So the policing phase, the, um, it's really key is the research projects, the products. So the key point is that research products can emerge at any time during the life cycle of a research project. We have to stop thinking about a research project ending with a peer reviewed journal article. And we kind of wrap everything up and, and everything backs up that research article. That's important. That's that pink line that you see throughout. That all does need to be wrapped up and be perfect for when you're presenting your research results to everyone. But throughout the whole work flow of your project, there are more intermediate steps that can be important, not just for the research community, but for yourself in defining who you are as a researcher or defining who you are in your career. If you plan to become a professor, um, maybe spending more time on that, those end products and wrapping them up neatly is going to be more important than writing a perfect, you know, software product uh, or a scientific piece of software that is um, really well tested and well documented for consumption from the community. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that there isn't enough time for everything. So you really need to be keeping yourself and the incentives of your career at the forefront and having those conversations with your team and your PI and where you're going with all of that. Um, you wanna keep, there's a lot of effort put into research projects and they should be defined by these three motivations, getting credit for your work, gaining skills for your next career step, and of course, supporting the results of your research. And again, I wanna push having these conversations more within your team. So understanding where everyone is coming from when discussing this. So I'm not gonna go into specific research project uh, products that come out of each space that are important and how they can be important in your um, overall, how you perform your research, but they can come again at any stage and you can get credit for things that usually aren't valued within academia. Like if you have a data badge plan, you can publish that now. If you create a R library, you can publish that now. Um, balance what you want from your career in academia, or if you're gonna go into industry, balance what you need. 
And so the main takeaways are a research project success is more than just a traditional peer reviewed paper. Standards are defined by your community and alternative research, research projects. They get credit for your skills, but they also help you def define your reproducible data analysis workflow. And don't be scared, computational reproducibility in the end is just a fancy word for being really organized. And I truly believe that the, the skills it takes to do computational reproducible work is where all the really big questions are, like the questions I'm interested in, like how organisms react to climate change. And that's kind of where I'm going now. I wanna have big teams with lots of, taking advantage of big public resources of data repositories. I have some questions here to ask yourself to change the culture of more incorporating this into your lab culture. And I'd like to thank Sarah and Valerie and Bids in general and Rebecca Barter for her helpful feedbacks and edits on the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Sierra. Um, Jag, would you come back up? Uh, well, I have a, have a few questions to talk about. Sierra, will you take down your slides? Do Good. Yes. Thank you. Question for uh, both of you guys. Um, do you imagine, because we're, we've been talking about, you know, the application of AI and the, the use of data, do you, got, do you both see a time when we will have regulations behind all this? And maybe how far out it would be if we do? Yes, we will have regulation. Um, I think that uh, regulation is a tool. It's not an answer. Uh, it's it's sort of a it, it's a part of the overall societal response. Uh, my favorite story on this is with respect to spam. You know, uh, unsolicited messages were considered a great thing at one point uh, before we all had our mailboxes flooded and realized that we couldn't deal with it. And it very quickly went from being a novel innovation to something that was socially unacceptable. And I think that that, that quick trip to social unacceptability then led to regulation. And regulation doesn't mean absence. It just means regulation, means limiting. We are currently at a reasonable equilibrium point with respect to spam. And that there is a lot of spam. We have spam filters. None of this is perfect, but we all have reasonable operating communication mechanisms and, and get along with our lives and use our email and other communication modes. Um, and it works. So I see a similar thing happening very fast with facial recognition in terms of sort of societal response. I think that for most of the other issues uh, with respect to the use of data for decision-making and uh, particularly equity issues, these are complex things and we haven't gotten them to the simple soundbite societal gut response type of situation yet. Yeah, I think that's well said. And I, I think that re more regulation is going to come with people being more into what their data is saying and people becoming over time more data literate themselves as a society. I think that as a society, we need to get more people into the field, more diverse people into the field, and really get people to think about how, how much responsibility we need to take for our, our own data and the data around us and the data out of our communities and get protective of it, but also get excited about it. <laughs> like, I want more people to be excited about the data and the information that's all around us. And I think that will really lead to the policy changes when people start asking for it a little bit more. 
Thank you. Uh, one, and there was a question, uh, data equity might be easier to account for certain problems. How do we ensure representation in less obvious algorithms, for example, models for, uh, for example, models for brain tumor segmentation from patient MRIs? Yeah, I think the big challenge with representation is you've got to know what matters. Uh, or what could matter uh, for a for a medical question? Uh, it isn't clear that you know things like race and sex and things are are central. There are some things where that are highly correlated with with these things, but um, many medical things are not, and and they might be correlated with you know other other things that that matter and one has to understand what factors matter and make sure that one is getting good coverage of the factors that matter. And yeah, there's no easy answer. Yeah, I thought you made a very good point about when you mentioned basically that the, the algorithms learn shape and when you start moving them to other places, um, they take that shape with them. And um, it, as, cause you know, obviously data science is interdisciplinary and we're all reusing each other's stuff, but we, we forget that often. And that it's, you know, you apply something in computational biology and then apply something to, you know, social networks, it's, it's not the same thing. Right, and I think this is where the kind of stuff that Sierra was talking about becomes so important in terms of yeah. understanding what what it means to do open science and uh, understand how somebody can reuse somebody else's work. Yeah, I think these talks complemented each other well because it's uh, first one, you know, talking about the importance of all of it, but Sierra, it was great to hear what you got, like, how do you actually do that? So uh, knowing that there's a nice little out how to um, out there. Um, from you, from you know, um, industry point of view, do you guys um, talk much to industry? Because it seems like this is a place where uh, these regulations are very much needed, and you know, um, or not these these ideas, because they're becoming our part of our day to day life. Um, so being in the Bay Area. I'm always talking with data scientists in industry and they're actually tackling very similar problems that academia is interested in. And to, to frame the scope of that paper, we did focus on academic data science, but they're also battling with like, yeah. you know, they have a team of software engineers that they need to communicate with the data, uh, the data scientists. And sometimes it gets muddled the roles. And um, one thing I love that both of our talks talked about is that the defining of things. I loved how Jag's talk, you were you're not just going data equity, it's going on to feature equity, like really splitting apart and really defining what all of this that we're talking about and how we share this information through domains. Um, but yeah, I think they're, de they're dealing with similar issues, except, you know, the regulation part is a little bit more, uh, <laughs> the motivations are a lot different. Yeah. Um, I think uh, one part person asked, uh, can you point us to a bibliography of research on fairness in AI or keywords or names? I think it, it, they were looking for, you know, some sort of uh, source material where they can learn, I think, um, more about these, these talks. Uh, is there anything that you guys would recommend? I mean, clearly the citations in your paper would probably be useful. Um. Yeah, so um, I'm going to, so one, one for fairness in AI specifically, um, uh, there is the FACCT series of conferences and uh, the, this conference has changed names a bit. It used to be called FAT STAR. Um, and before that, it was a workshop called FATML, um, where the FAT or the FACCT is Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency. Um, so that's, that's a good place to start. Um, as, as I said in my talk, I think that, you know, focus on fairness is a little too narrow. Um, our 
project website has has a white paper with uh, with with good bibliography. So that's midas.umish.edu slash fides, F-I-D-E-S. Um, and I'd encourage you to go get that white paper too. And if fairness and AI also, I've learned a lot from advocates within um, the Mozilla Foundation and organization right now is really focused on that for maybe not more dense topics, but it gives you a well-rounded of researchers and um, further information, especially policies being made in different countries, which I find really fascinating. I think Europe's way ahead of us on that, on that front. Well, it's 301, so I'm gonna let you guys go. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I enjoyed the talks very much. Sierra, I loved your use of phylogenetic trees. It's in me. It's I, I saw what you were doing there. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much, Angela. Thank you. Bye, sir. Bye, Doug.